I was muted then and I started talking. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode where I'm talking to Mark Humphreys, who is a computational neuroscientist at the University of Nottingham. Uh, do you want to introduce a little bit about yourself, your interests, and what it is that you do your research in? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. I think I have, thank you for having me on. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm at University of Nottingham now. Um, so, so computational neuroscientist, so I'm the person who has job it is to figure out um, what the data all means. So uh, figure out sort of what the the computations and coding of neurons in the brain. Um, so my lab works pretty widely. We work on problems from um, the sensory cortex of rats, where the bits of the cortex where the whiskers send their information in rats, to um, the motor system in sea slugs about how they crawl along the seafloor. So our, our sort of binding thing we're interested in across all our different projects is the question of how lots of neurons in the brain do what they do together. So how multiple neurons encode information together or compute it together rather than looking at one neuron at a time. Um, yeah, that's, that's taken us across a huge range of data and a huge range of computational problems, which is how I ended up synthesizing a lot of it into a, into a book. And it's a relatively new field. Um, I mean, computers haven't been around all that long. And I guess the, the field of neuroscience itself is quite um, modern, even though people have been thinking about these questions for a long time. Do you find that um, the landscape is shifting quite fast or is it is it something that's kind of, um, you kind of like trapped at a bunch of dead ends and stuff? How, how is that research going? Well, one of the advantages of researching the brain is that there's never a dead end. <laughs> it's it's okay. a phenomenally complicated thing to look at that, yeah, if you ever reach a particular dead end in your research, there's another little pathway you miss somewhere you can you can go down. You're right that neuroscience itself is fairly young. The first sort of neuroscience degree programs weren't founded until the late 60s, early 70s in the States. Um, and that's that's partly when sort of neuroscience become became sort of separate from from sort of underlying biology as a general discipline, this idea of specializing in these cells that are in the brain as opposed to cells that are anywhere else in the body or in a plant or something. Um, and really neuroscience has sort of accelerated to, to come this enormous behemoth research field. Um, so there's no doubt at the moment that research in neuroscience is going, particularly in the area of neuroscience I'm in, which is the systems neuroscience area, where it's um, research where you record from multiple neurons at the same time, so you're recording from more than one neuron at once, hopefully in more than one brain region at once, and you're trying to figure out what those neurons are doing together. So that, that field is just exploding exponentially. There's the technology to record lots of neurons or manipulate them has been is advancing. Practically you know, every six months there's a new there's a new major step forward at the moment. So you've made, recently oh yeah. sorry, do you, do you want to right. finish your thought there? I was yeah, gonna say you've make it timely for the for writing a book. <laughs> I was good. Yeah, you've you've recently written this book, uh, The Spike, which is basically talking about a journey through the brain from the perspective of a spike. So it's touching on various bases. There's, um, I suppose, a bit about cell signaling and what goes on, a bit of cell biology in there, a little bit of computational type stuff, um, a little bit of the anatomy of the brain. It, it's I, I read a blog post actually you posted today as well where you talked about some of your thoughts behind writing the book and and um. I guess how you wanted to make what you do accessible as well to an audience. Do you want to talk about some of those motivations and stuff that went behind this before we get into the content and talking about what spikes are? Yeah, sure. So part of my motivation was just to to write a uh, a broadly accessible book about about spikes, about the way these neurons talk to each other. Because as I was just alluding to, we have these now, particularly in the last two decades, this incredible amount of research at that that level of the brain about how what we now know about how neurons talk to each other and what it means when they do um but very little of it appears in the public domain so you see almost nothing in the sort of you know in in media reports or breaking research in area xyz when you do see neuroscience in in popular press it's either obviously breakthrough in some important drug or treatment for some sort of kind of disorder or whether in human clinical trials or in animals or it's um fmri stuff or we found a bit of brain in humans that lights up when they when they feel in love or something okay. uh, so there's this whole whole gap where this this vast chunks of research into exactly how the brain does or what it does is just completely missing from the sort of public sphere. So I wanted to write the book to try and convey that. Um, and in doing so, then there was yeah there is a there is a the book itself is a, it's a journey as you say through the brain. So it's it gives you at one level a sightseeing tour of various parts of the brain and our rough ideas of what it is they do at the level of these individual neurons and the messages, the spikes they're sending. 
at the same time, then I wanted that that journey to be like a narrative backbone, so that the the journey through the brain would be accompanied by an increasing journey of following these spikes will be a increasing journey of the complexity of the things that spikes do. So taking from the basics of uh, what they are and how they're produced um, up to complex ideas of how they will operate in networks and how they uh, how they uh, um, how they do things together, how they code and compute things. And then the third was obviously then that in doing that, I'll give a, a, a like a, uh, a tour then of all this last two decades worth of great work in, in systems neuroscience. Awesome. So the first question then is, what is a spike um, to get a, get us started? I mean, I think most people are vaguely familiar uh, with this idea that there are neurons in the brain and that there's electricity going around. But um, spike is probably a new bit of terminology for people to kind of wrap their heads around. So what, what are you talking about when you when you talk about spikes? Yeah. So sp spikes are, are so the spikes do uh, two ways of describing spikes. One is the prosaic way, the sort of biology way is a spike is is what neuroscientists have all called the action potential. It is the rapid jump and fall of uh, voltage at the neuron's body, which is the signal it's going to send from its body down its axon to talk to other neurons. Um, so that's the so the prosaic version is that it's this this voltage fluctuation which is driven by ion channels in the cell membrane opening and closing and these ions shuttling back and forward to drive the voltage up and then down. Um, in terms of computation, it's more important thing is that the, sp the spike is a single event, it's a single it's a thing that lasts about a millisecond. It's either there or it isn't, and it's a, a statement by the neuron that something needed to be transmitted, some message needed to be sent to the next neurons along. So um, when we study spikes at a computational level, we take away all of that sort of detail of the voltage fluctuations. We're just interested in whether it happened or it didn't. So almost all of our interest in spikes is, did it send a message or not? And then how many did it send and where did it send them? And one of the reasons are that these, these, the reason they're called the spikes, by the way, is because if you look, see them on an oscilloscope, this rapid jump and fall of voltage, it looks like of all the world, like it's just a very big spike of voltage that you can see. You can barely see the sort of the fall and the rise and fall version. You can just see this big jump. Right. Um, and uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, so the um, so the important part is that they are this all or none event. And it, compared to other yeah. the, the the things that are sort of the other processes that happen in the brain, which are going on all the time. So intracellular signaling stuff and molecules sloshing around everywhere. They're really really sparse. So there's um, sort of the in cortex, the neurons that send the most spikes will send at most, say, 30 in a second. And they only do that for a few seconds. So most neurons are sending only a handful at, mo at best, maybe one or two um, every second, some are much less than that. So they're really, uh, compared to the sort of diff that the, the general processes of biology, they're really quite sparse. So I guess we're going to talk about some of the things that um, spikes are involved in. But is there, I mean, in terms of our everyday experiences people I, I think it we can kind of point to some things in biology and say oh there's that going on can you sort of point to spikes in your experience somehow I mean is there a, like if you get knocked on the head or see a flash of light was that like a spike or is it just it's so um you know it's it's so kind of under the surface that people aren't going to be people who aren't familiar with the biology and the neurology and stuff aren't going to be able to really see what's going on with spikes you know without without being aware of the data and stuff yeah, there's a, there's a little of that issue, which is why, why one of the reasons of writing the book. So the, the most sort of closest experience that we have of spikes really is if you try and intent do something and intentionally move your finger. Right. Okay. So if you intentionally move your finger, that's you um, intentionally sending some spikes from somewhere in your motor cortex down through the spinal cord. That then that the axons coming out the spinal cord to the uh, end plate on your muscle in your forearm. And it's the spikes are arriving at that point, and the more you, the tighter you want to, or more rapidly you want to move your finger, the more spikes are being sent. So you can control the amount of spikes you want to send to your forearm muscle by either slowly moving your finger or really rapidly moving your finger. And uh, you, you can play with that. Um, indeed, this is how how spikes were studied for uh, centuries before we even could see them, because you could you knew there was electricity being used to to, to create movement because you also you could stimulate those nerves with electricity and create the same movement that you can do you know, intentionally yourself. Um, so that kind of so movement is really the place where we can we can sort of have a grasp of the fact that these little tiny pulses of electricity right. are streaming down axons to muscles and they are they are causing these muscles to contract. Um, 
but everything else is kind of hidden because all of our senses, of course, are transmitted by spikes, but we don't have a sense of them being in this little pulsed voltage sent between neurons. It's a continuous experience as far as we're concerned. So this kind of uh, leads into the next question about how are spikes generated? So you sort of paint the picture of someone who wants a cookie in the book and talk, speak through, uh, talk about how, um, you, well, you described various elements of the kind of cell biology that's going on, um, how you need to reach a certain voltage threshold in terms of things being transmitted and stuff, which is part of the next question. So how, how do these spikes get generated, say, um, maybe using the visual system as an example? So the, so the key part really is, is that see each individual neuron obviously has its body and that sticking out of that body is this, the big tree called the dendrite. And it's that dendrite on which you gather all the inputs from the other neurons. So, so spike generation is a, is, a, is a circular problem. Right? So you need spikes arriving from other neurons to generate a new spike. Right. So spikes arrive from other neurons on the dendritic tree of a given neuron that we're sitting on. Um, and each of those spikes arriving isn't transmitted faithfully. It's it's transmitted in the form of little uh, chemicals that go across the synapse to the other side, and they create a little voltage blip, or much smaller than a spike. And the voltage blip adds up with all the other voltage blips that come down the, the, the dendrites to the cell's body. And if those if that summation gets big enough, which is some as you say a, a tipping point, then a spike gets generated. So a neuron sending a spike is essentially a message saying my inputs were sufficiently large at this point that I was able to generate my own spike. So that means it's conveying some kind of information about the pattern or timing of inputs to its to its dendritic tree. Um, so in terms of you know, an example, if it was in the, a neuron in the very first area of your visual cortex, so the visual cortex right at the back of your brain, the bit that gets direct input from your eye, then the first neuron there, um, it's getting inputs from the retina, which is telling it, OK, there's a pattern of light over here and a pattern of dark over here. So it will have inputs from the retina falling on its dendritic tree, each of them sending spikes. And if enough voltage fluctuations happen so that it sends a spike, then it's going to mean that there is that pattern of light and dark forms an edge somewhere, an edge of a particular angle or particular thickness in some tiny point of space that, that that neuron can see. And then all the neurons next to that neuron will also be looking at that same point of space and also looking for the similar kind of edges and be sending spikes that they see it too. So the next question then is, how do these spikes actually encode information? And I think in most people's minds, there's this there's this idea of sort of um, that maybe the way a computer represents information. You know, you've got you've got some kind of translation into binary, and that's stored in memory somewhere. Or some people maybe think of it or have thought of it historically, like sort of wax, and there's an imprint in it. But that you know, like for me to see. The color red. There isn't like a red. There isn't redness in my neurons in my brain. Or for me to sort of think about um, the cookie, for example, there isn't a cookie in my brain or a cookie-shaped neuron. So how how do these spikes actually encode that information and represent? So that's a deep question. No, yeah. Next, 40, a next, next forty-five yeah. minutes talking about that one. Uh, but the the basic level, yeah, the basic sort of answer is. As you say, the the key thing to grasp is obviously that the spikes are sent by all neurons. So it's the brain's common language in which it's speaking about everything, whether or not it's speaking about color or shape or texture or sound or smell or taste or the movement of an arm, all those neurons doing all those things are all sending spikes. So um, in terms of encoding information, what we, we when we look at neurons that are very close to the sensory apparatus that we have, so neurons that are like in that very early part of visual cortex or neurons that are in the very first part of the cortex that receives input from the ears, say, then when we look at the spikes coming out of these neurons, we can relate them directly to elements of the world. So like that first visual cortex neuron that uh, is sending spikes in response to a little edge, uh, or there'll be neurons in the auditory cortex sending spikes in response to a tone of a particular frequency at a particular um, amplitude. Uh, so those, are, those, those spikes mean elementary sort of bits of information about the world outside. Um, those are... We're not entirely clear that, of course, that is what that neuron actually encodes. That's a description that okay. we give it as an observer, because where we are, we are, you know, playing a sound or we're showing a picture, and we are, as we're changing, say, for, you know, we're showing a a line to to 
an animal I'm recording from its neurons in its visual cortex. As we rotate that line from the horizontal to the vertical, then we can see how many spikes is being sent by the neurons. At some point, they'll send more spikes to a line that's, say, vertical than they will horizontal. So mm -hmm. we can say that neuron seems to prefer vertical lines. Um, and then it makes kind of sense that it's, it encodes verticalness in some way, but we don't know that's how the brain, that's what it means to the brain. Right? So that's one of the, the sort of deep questions of neuroscience really is, we can read out a lot of what the information in the spikes means to us, the observer, but there is no observer in the brain. So what it means right. to the brain is often quite opaque. So, you, I mean, you talked about um, competing explanations of what might be going on with um, information encoding in the brain. So it's, is there some debate over, for example, whether it's like the the frequency of spikes that are received or the amplitude of spikes that does the kind of encoding? Um, do you want to speak a little bit to that? Is that enough yeah, information sure. in the question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Um, so yes, you're right. So um, in terms of how people have thought about di the different ways that spikes can encode information, there's these two classic camps. So one is what in the book I call the counters, which is the people who believe that neurons encode information by how many spikes they send. So in the example I just gave of the, the line that's being changed in its angle, um, then the, if, if that neuron sends more spikes to a vertical line than a horizontal line, then the counters would say that it, that's it encoding the verticalness in its number of spikes. Right. And we could read out the angle of that line by the number of spikes it sends, because as you increase from the horizontal to the, to the vertical, you get more and more spikes from this neuron. So we can sort of continuously read out the angle, more or less. There's another um, whole group, though, who believe that neurons encode information by how they, the time that they send spikes. Right. So that they send it I am either immediately as something happens or with a delay after something happens. And that timing gives all the information that you need to know what has happened. So there are really were work examples of this in, say, how, um, how owls work out where prey are according to the sound they make. So the delay, that, the sounds that the prey makes between the two ears of the owl, the circuit that works out the angle to the prey relies on precise spike timing between the left and the right ear being transmitted to the same neuron. And the delay between those spikes arriving at the same neuron is the, del the sort of delay between the left and right ears, right. and that's the angle that the prey is at. Interesting. Um, and there are other yeah, numerous examples in, for example, particularly in, in like uh, the most sort of simple sensory sy sensory systems, the neurons that are closest to the sensory systems, where they clearly use timing of spikes rather than numbers of spikes. Right. Um, on the other hand, we have great evidence that things use numbers of spikes. So your motor neurons in your spinal cord the more, as I said towards the beginning, the more spikes your motor neurons send, the more contracted your muscle is. Um, so there's, we, we, we kind of feel like both are used in the brain and we don't quite understand when or how to turn one into the other. Right, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, when you have questions like that, I suppose, and this, get, this gets a little bit into methodology and I suppose the previous question as well, how do you actually go about investigating these things? Presumably, you've got to have you got to think of the methodology and it's kind of unique. Uh, is there any way of? I, I'm thinking about, for example, especially when it comes to phenomenology of experience. You're going off of someone's reporting something in correlations. Um, like how how do you actually begin to work, chip away at things and come up with new method methodologies for tackling this thing when it's just this sort of big confusing mess of stuff going on in people's brains? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> it's, Is that too? It, it's tough. So that's, I mean, so as we get to, I think to, a bit later on, obviously this is why my, obviously much most of this work is done in animal models, so which we when we record lots of neurons, um, and that makes it doubly tough because we don't even have then report correlations. We can't just ask the the rat in question, "Did you see something?" We yeah. have to give it a task to do to make sure it saw something. Um, right. And this also partly explains why so much of neuroscience research is focused on the periphery of what the brain does. So, so much is focused on the visual, early visual system and auditory system, and so much is focused on the motor system, because those are the neurons that are closest to um, sort of the observable universe. So closest to, you know, the, the things that we can be seen or the things that can be moved and that we have some grasp of. And the deeper we get into the brain, the harder it is to work out what on earth these neurons are firing in relation to. Um, and one way to chip away at this is that we we can check that if we believe an information has been coded in a neuron in a particular way, that indeed we can decode that information. So we can pull out some of the tricks of machine learning and use these, parse it, 
pass the machine learning tricks, whatever the sort of like classifier or some kind of decoder, pass them these spikes, and uh, ask the decoder, given these spikes in this form, can we decode the thing that's happening in the world? So for example, can we decode the angle of the line or can we decode the pitch of the sound or um, can we decode whether an animal chose to go left or right? Um, and ideally then, if, if our guess is right and information is being encoded in that form, then the decoder can read it out. Of course, that makes a whole bunch of other assumptions that the brain somehow is using this, whatever decoder that we use or the classifier that we use, um, and that it's not correlated with something else. So for example, um, you might think that uh, you can decode with an animal's moving left or right from the spikes you're receiving from some part of the brain. But as it turns out, all that neurons really encoding is whether that arm is light or dark. So yeah, I, re I realized that I gave you about the most vague question possible. Um, so thank you for recovering it with an answer that, that made sense. Um, in terms of the the um, next question, you also talked about decision making um, and how spikes are associated with decision making. And I think for a lot of people, as they start, uh, and this this includes me, I suppose, and a lot of people, as as we start to think about the brain as this deterministic system of spikes, um, it begins to sort of rub up against our, our experience of making decisions. And you talk a little bit in the book about regions of the brain, like I think uh, the parietal or parietal cortex and the cingulate cortex um and how so how are spikes involved in these decision making processes whether it's um whether it's sort of at a sub perceptual level of the making the decision i suppose of what to represent to the person between maybe competing uh competing things that are going on or and then what we can come on to as well like the the idea of a will that's making decisions between things as well yeah. Okay. Good. We'll do the yeah, first one. <laughs> Easy yeah. one first. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, so we have. Yeah. So let's talk about in the book. So there, there is there is quite a lot of work recently on on um, how neurons seem to encode the information you need to make a decision, and how they send spikes in a way that looks like they're adding up evidence about what's happening in the world. So there is. There are these famous neurons throughout parietal cortex, and also we can now find them in bits of prefrontal cortex and deeper in the brain too. Um, which when we give an animal a task where it has to observe something for a while, so classically it would be observing a series of randomly moving dots on a screen. And it's being asked, are these dots moving to the left, mostly or to the right? Also most of them are moving at random. There's only a few that are moving in that particular direction. So it typically has to sit there and stare at the dots for a while. When it stares at these dots, you can find these neurons in the parietal cortex who send spikes um, that seem to be accumulating according to the direction that they're interested in. So if this neuron is encoding for a leftward decision, then every time there is a bit of evidence that the, the dots are moving left, these spikes seem to increase in number. So over uh, the time that this animal is sitting here, you can see these neurons with these slowly increasing numbers of spikes that look for all the world like they're accumulating evidence towards the fact that it's moving to the left. Another fact moving to the right, and one of the key bits of evidence that we think it's in a it's a it's related to the decision is that these spikes would accumulate according to how much evidence there is. So the easier the task it is, the faster these neurons increase their firing, as though they're accumulating evidence more more quickly. And as well as sort of increasing their spiking to to look like this sort of accumulation of evidence for this decision, they all seem to reach the same sort of maximum value of spiking at the point decision is made and then they reset they stop increasing so it's this they look all for the for the world like they are doing a, a perfect rendition of classical statistical tests for decision making between two or more alternatives so things like the sequential probability ratio test which is um, not particularly famous except in the world of decision making um as a way of optimally accumulating information to make a decision um of course these caveat here of course is that these are these are neurons in a highly constrained world where you have to make a choice between left and right while looking at some dots on a screen or sometimes it's rats listening to a bunch of auditory clicks, some to the right ear, some to the left ear, right. trying to work out whether it's the right ear has more clicks than the left ear. And so this is about slow evidence accumulation um, where we can record neurons for ages and we can look at their spikes happening over this time period. Of course, more sort of immediate decision making, we still have a very poor grasp of because it's very hard to uh, understand the correlates of some kind of immediate snap decision. 
indeed that often goes under the term of action selection rather than decision making does um is what you're describing there almost like a, a piece of hardware that models something like bayesian reasoning where there's kind of like a, a prior and then there's some evidence that gets layered on top which changes the output or is is that kind of dissociated i see i see a lot of talk about um bayesian models in machine learning and and stuff like that is that coming from this sort of research or is that something else entirely so there are yeah there are quite a few bayesian models of this of this kind of data um, indeed, so people have looked for some evidence and found a little bit of evidence that you can see priors in this stuff. So, for example, um, also if you're if you're looking at these this these sort of dots moving, and you bias the stimulus so that you get they are going to move on each across all the trials that the animal is going to see it, you bias it so that it's going to move to the right a bit more and move to the left rather than being equally distributed. Then you can see it sometimes that there are neurons who will who's firing before the stimulus starts is already elevated on the rightward neurons from the leftward neurons. So it's as though there is a, um, a prior there expecting, uh, expecting that the next stimulus will be going to the right because more often than not, it has been going to the right. Right. Um, yes. So there are well, literally indeed... right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry, were you going to finish your thought then? I think there's a little bit of a delay, so I can I, I can uh, sort of interrupt on the end of what you're saying, and I'm not doing it intentionally. It's just the sort of uh, delay that's on the thing. So the one, one famous thing, I think, with the second part of that question to do with um, the idea of will and how that can be reconciled with um, this sort of physical, fit, ca causally deterministic picture, um, a lot of people look to the Liber experiments to show that we don't have uh, free will. And there's a lot of, you know, like it, it's contentious exactly how you interpret that data. Um, now, what are your thoughts on what the LIBA experiments show and how is that associated um, to spikes and what spikes do? I mean, what, what, how have things progressed since the 80s or whatever when that, you know, when that data was collected? So let's, let's double check where I'm um, <laughs> remembering the LIBA experiments, right? So yes. this is the ones where the, the, the EEG recordings where we have the, uh, a finger uh, wagging, I think, what, like yeah. will, and, and when, and you, um, I think they record when the perceptual awareness is reported of willing, willing it, and then, or oh, I forget the exact timing. It's something like two point three. I, I can't remember milli or microseconds, something uh, before. There's, there's, they measure. Um, I think it was EEG. I don't know, pr presumably because of the the time. Oh, humans, yeah, yeah. I think it was, there's an event, event related potential over the motor cortex about. Two or three hundred milliseconds before that, before the beginning of the report of of the sensation. Yeah. Yes. Right. So yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, so that's a question of yeah of as you say. Of, so there's a distinction between the perceptual awareness of of something about to happen and it actually happening. Um, from these from these uh, experiments where we've got these recordings of all these neurons looking at the movements of dots on the screen. We know we they are this accumulation is causal because we can perturb that accumulation. So people have done experiments where they put stimulated that part of the brain um, during the accumulation and perturbed the decision that then happened. Um, you can do the extreme version, of course, which is you can go in and you can um, freeze a chunk of the brain in an animal and then right. completely ruin its ability to make a decision because it can no longer properly accumulate evidence. So we so we can at least know that. The accumulation signals we're seeing are not just epiphenomenon of something. They are they appear to be some way causal for, for the decision. Right. Um, obviously, it's quite hard to ask, again, uh, a rat whether or not it was aware of making yeah. the, of the yeah. decision before it, you know, before um, it, in this case for the rat, it would have licked left or licked right to, to indicate its decision. Um, and the LIBO experiments are a little bit about really they're kind of really about kind of the direction that direction of consciousness as much as about decision making. They're about um, we have this idea that obviously we are conscious awareness of action is the thing that causes yeah yeah some sort of intentional action. Um, whereas it's pretty hard to find solid evidence that that is actually the case. Right. So um, we um, it's it's quite hard to to particularly in animals, figure out experiments where we can we can we can query when an animal was aware of something um, compared to when its activity was aware of something. Right. 
Uh, typically, we can, you know, we are, um, we can see that the animal's brain is capable of making a decision long before it actually makes a decision in many cases. So the, uh, the evidence becomes unambiguous sometime before the decision is made. Um, and indeed, even in, even in these experiments with the dots, um, moving dots, there is a delay of 100, 150 milliseconds between the point where they, those neurons have made a decision. They reach that threshold and they stop accumulating. And the actual movement to happen, there's a long gap. So there's a whole lot of motor processing stuff that needs to happen after that. Um, so in that, that, and indeed in that, that gap, obviously that, that decision was to move was made then 200 milliseconds before um, the movement actually starts in that animal. And the rest of it was just housekeeping, essentially, to, to make the movement happen. Right. So it's un. So um, yeah. So I say that our, our, our studying of the animals is 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 giving us a huge amount of knowledge of the spiking, but isn't really enabling us close this gap on right the gap between sort of intentional will and our understanding of um, the extent to which we are we are you know the our conscious thought of moving has anything to do with moving or it's just a readout or something that's already been decided somewhere else. Awesome. Uh, so the next question then is this question of some of the, some spikes seem to terminate, terminate without serving um, a meaningful functional role, I suppose. Maybe that's an inappropriate way of phrasing it. You can tell me, but, um, and you, I think you said this is one of your favorite questions in the Royal Institute talk that you gave. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, so yeah, why, why do some spikes terminate or, or seem to terminate without serving a meaningful function? So I guess what yeah, you're getting at here is this, this idea of the spike failure, right? Yes. Um, that's, um, so yeah, so having, um, so a neuron goes through all this problem of, of creating a spike, it transmits, transmits it down its axon and it's, um, from its axon in a cortical main cortical pyramidal cell in a mouse cortex will probably contact somewhere between 7,500 to 10,000 other neurons. So you would assume that it, having created this spike, this spike will then be reach the synapses of all these 10,000 connections and be cause a response on the other side and the other neuron. But as it turns out, that's not true. So most of those, those synapses will fail. When the spike gets there, nothing will happen whatsoever. So as you say, it will terminate at each of these synapses without having caused anything. And these failure rates can be quite enormous. So there are recordings in the hippocampus of synapses between pyramidal cells, which have a failure rate of 90%, which means only one in 10 spikes reaching this connection between neurons is causing anything to happen. Um, and this is this is odd, right? So one, one, one argument would be that this is just um, a bug, maybe just biology inevitably has this noisiness in it and because of the, the you know how much of so the molecular machinery is packed into this enormous incredibly tiny space there's just it's inevitable that when a spike reaches the, the, the synapse the machinery that machinery that has to unfold to let the transmitter get released on the synapse to the other side maybe that just has to fail sometimes but then there's other neurons in the brain where their their, their synapses never fail at all so um it appears to be something that can be can be tuned right and um so what i talk about in the book uh, is that there are some really quite lovely theories about why you'd want to have this apparent complete waste of energy um and to have this i think ability to tune this this failure um and it's quite a quite a paradox because obviously we know that our, our brains are really energy hungry right so our you know uh, the standard figure we give is roughly about 20% of our daily energy requirements are just for our brain alone, even though it weighs what, one and a half kilos. And the, on the moment to moment or use of our brain, about 45% of it is used up making spikes. So using up 45% of that 20% just to make spikes that then don't do anything, it seems right. to be a spectacular waste of energy. Um, so, yeah, there's a range of theories and one of what i guess let me pick my favorite so one of my favorites is the is this idea that it's this failure is intentional from the point of view of the neuron getting the spikes that it's in control of of what fails and what doesn't because what it wants to do is it wants to make sure that the when it sends its own spikes and it can only send a few every second as we talked about right at the start 
that those few spikes are a really sort of um, a really small range of information that they can send. So because it can only send a small amount of information itself, there's no point in it receiving vast barriers of information from the 10,000 neurons that it connects to it. So it actually wants to ignore most of the information that's being sent so that it doesn't um, spend all of its energy processing all these inputs only for it to be had to throw away all the information because it can only send a few bits of information in its output. So mm -hmm. from this point of view, what that failure is doing is it's allowing the neuron to tune its input information to match its output information so it doesn't waste itself any input it gets or any energy it's spending on processing all that inputs that's really interesting another another question of sort of weirdness and waste that you bring up is this problem of uh dark neurons in the brain um and so i suppose to kick us off what are dark neurons so these are neurons that um send spikes extremely rarely so by extremely rarely i mean um less than sort of one spike a minute and um originally we didn't really know that they existed because most of the ways we have have had in historically recording neurons um they are electrodes you lower blindly into a brain somewhere and the only way you know that electrode is recording from a neuron is because you can see that neuron's signal on your oscilloscope in your lab or you can hear it on your speakers going tick 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 so the only way you could find a neuron to record was because it was sending spikes which meant that the only neurons we could record were the ones sending spikes. We didn't know there weren't neurons not sending spikes because you couldn't see them. Um, and then advanced technology meant that we could we could then image neurons. We could basically stick them under a high power to video camera through video them through a microscope, and you could see physically see all the neurons, and then you could see which ones were firing and which ones were not. And when you did that, you could see that the vast majority of them weren't firing at all for most of the time that you looked at them. And almost irrespective of what the animal you were, whose brain it was, was doing at the time. Um, so it appears that there are, in fact, um, the majority of neurons in any given region of the brain, particularly in cortex that you record from, um, are sending spikes extremely infrequently. So much, much less than one every second, maybe one every minute, or even less. And then, so that means that they are, as I said in the book, they are the dark in the sense that. Um, there is obviously this huge amount of mass you carry around in your head, this huge number of neurons that are not sending you information, they're not doing anything as far as you're concerned. We're running our experiment, we're observing these neurons for half an hour, an hour at a time. Um, and again, that's another um, energy paradox because, again, we use a huge amount of energy to just keep these neurons alive. And of course, they receive lots of spikes, they must do. So um, they use all this information, there's all this energy processing those inputs, but they don't send anything. And that's, uh, again, I'm not a real quandary and the kind of quandary that theorists love. But um, one reason I wanted to talk about them in the book is because we don't really have any great theories about what they're for. Right. So one of the, I mean, one of the simplest theories is that actually they are just like any other neuron. It's just that because we only observe them in the lab for a short period of time, say we do lots of, you know, we can record for a few hours at a time at most then those neurons are just not being given anything to do that they're interested in the world. So they're just not, right. the world, the lab for them is too dull to be doing anything. So if we were to observe them for in that animal for the whole the animal's lifetime in its natural environment, we'd no doubt discover exactly what it is that they were doing in this, in this theory that we've, we would see that they were, you know, they were tuned to particular aspects of its environment or particular movements that it would do naturally that we never see in the lab. Um, but obviously finding that kind of data would be extremely difficult because it would mean being able to record for years at a time and make sense of that data once you got it. Um, well, both of which are you know, currently yeah. impossible, but um, but obviously there are people, our exponential drive in technology at the moment means that no doubt it'll be possible someday quite soon. So I guess um, in, in terms of painting an evolutionary story of the way uh, of why our brain is the way that we seem to be discovering it is is it a little bit of a mystery or are there plausible stories i mean i think i think there's in a broader sense a kind of criticism i mean maybe this is more a popular level than an academic level of of telling just so stories about how things got to be the, the way they are but is is there um a plausible account then of why it is that way which seems to be so wasteful in these different aspects or 
is is it mostly a mystery and it's some it's just at the forefront and a, with a big question mark at the minute so there are there are um there are some good theories of of why we'd expect uh neural activity to be fairly sparse and again it's, a, it's an energy driven question it's um so this is well worked out for for sensory systems this idea that what you want, if you want to sort of maximize the amount of information you're being able to encode per amount of energy that you use, then of course you don't want that information to be encoded redundantly. We don't want the, you don't want multiple versions of the same bits of information being uh, created and transmitted at the same time. So, of course, also every, every copy you have uses up more energy that you want to use to do something else. And given that our brains are so energetically expensive, it would make sense if our brains were tuned so that um, the neurons that were doing this encoding of information were not redundant. So that would mean that whenever we see a particular uh, image in the world, that very few neurons are firing whenever we see that image. We have an, a neuron that is essentially dedicated to each little edge and line and angle at different locations in the world. And it's just those that are firing when we see a particular scene. And almost every other neuron, which is not interested in, it, in that particular angle, that particular area of space, is silent. So in that way, you get uh, uh, an account where um, the firing in the early visual areas and say also the early auditory areas is really, really sparse. So only a few neurons fire, and when they do fire, they only send a few spikes. Um, and that then is a, yeah, that is a is a is an argument driven from, from the fact that, it's, yes, the brain uses a huge amount of energy and obviously to evolve to the, to the state that you've got to even in simple mammals with you know, um, tens of millions of neurons even in the in the mouse brain, um, then it must have adopted energy efficient tricks pretty early on to be able to grow right. to these kind of sizes. Yeah. So I guess at this point we'll move on to some of those more difficult questions that are probably the the answers are probably going to be more um, opinion driven than sort of borne out by the evidence at this point. But um, we're going to talk about the explanatory gap problem and I've had a few philosophers on who have talked about various different philosophical theories of mind like panpsychism for example where they say you know conceptually you just can't get from um sort of third person nondescript matter to first person experience um now I'm interested to see what your take on this is as someone who's more in the sciences than you know like thinking about kind of like syllogisms and uh, and word, you know, like the meaning of words and stuff, which I mean, I think philosophy is valuable, but it's a different thing. I'd be interested to see, I mean, firstly, how you conceptualize the problem of this kind of explanatory gap between us looking at what neurons do in the brain and being like, well, we have an experience though. How do we, how do we get to that scientifically? Um, so, so what is the problem within your, how, how do neuroscientists look at this, this problem? Yeah. So we, We've touched on that problem a little bit already. So this the explanatory gap problem, as I laid out, is, is the separation between our the, the things of mind that are uniquely human, or which there are many. So things like obviously language and reading and maths and music and poetry and all the others, and the big C question, of course, um, and the fact that we can all our knowledge of how brains operate at a fundamental level, how, how they send spikes between neurons, is all from animal models. So we don't have Essentially, we have no information about how neurons operate at an individual neuron level in a human brain. So, we uh, so addressing questions of how the human brain generates uniquely human things is almost impossible to answer at the level that we really want to answer it, which is the level of how the neurons send spikes to each other. Because the only ways we have of accessing the human brain is through EEG, which is a very gross electrical signal on the scalp, which is a few billions of neurons firing away as one little EEG signal at one electrode. Or we have fMRI, which is uh, mostly used to, to look at blood flow in around millions of neurons. So each, you know, you've got your fMRI views of the brain where you have all these images of the cortex nicely colored in with little bits, say this bit's active here and not here. And those little, those big blobs of activity are going to be, um, are going to be a few billion neurons demanding a bit more blood with oxygen in it so they can burn more energy and do more stuff. Um, what it tells us about the spiking, of course, is completely, we have no idea because it's too gross a scale in both terms of neurons and terms of time as well. Um, so we, the expansion gap then is simply that, yeah, 
we have all these things we like to, to, to address about how the human mind relates to the human brain, at the level of how neurons operate, but we can't because we don't have the data. So, I mean, how do you think we should go about closing that gap? Uh, so, some people, I, I, I don't think, I wouldn't classify myself as one of them, but some people think that um, it's sort of, a, you know, pointless trying to do it because it, it just it just can't be done. It, you, you can't sort of um, get from third person descriptions to a kind of like first person experience or you can't, you can't even if you list every, every fact, as it were, from a third person point of view, you're never going to sort of describe what it's actually like to um I, I don't know taste or smell something but what what are your thoughts about answering that question or how 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 should people who are in the sciences go about um trying to figure that stuff out so, yeah so you're right obviously that it's that it's um it's a challenge that's difficult to know how to address because we it's the we see the same problem as we alluded to earlier in when we're looking at are recording some animal models that we can't just ask the animal what does it feel like to do this what is it so it's going to be no different that question is going to be no different when we we, we start recording from if we can start recording from neurons throughout the human brain um, we can record all the spikes that we want we're still missing then the sort of any kind of framework that takes us from or well, here are the the signals being sent back and forth that seem to underpin this experience we might even be able to perturb them to causally show they underpin that experience but then how they actually manifest as that experience is going to be quite opaque. Um, I mean, the best we can do in animal models is we can, we, can, we can find ways of having them report their confidence in a decision, for example, to get some insight into their sort of internal mental processes. We can, um, and we can uh, so get a good idea of the gap uh, between when the brain perceives something and when they report perceiving something that we touched on earlier. Um, but these are kind of fairly elementary sort of you know, aspects of aspects of mind. So the, I mean, prosaically, the closing the gap problem is partly is the problem of being able to record neurons in the human brain or whatever we like. Right. And um, there's two ways of doing that. So one is simply the sort of the Elon Musk way. So the neural link way, which is to simply say, we're going to do it um, without apparently considering the ethical issues of, of, what it would take to get ethical clearance for uh, implanting an, uh, um, an electrode deep inside a human brain of someone who is otherwise healthy. So obviously we can we can justify this in circumstances. For example, you know, with paralyzed patients, we have a, uh, there are um, groups of patients with electrodes planted in their motor cortex as part of research programs into how those those recordings will help them recover movement of their arms or produce speech. Um, we have recordings from brains of epileptics where the recordings are being done to trace. Um, where the epilepsy activity starts in their brain. So they're implanted temporarily to find that. Um, but the idea of implanting electrodes just into the healthy human brain, just to, for fun, um, is, is something that is, is, uh, requires quite a deal of thought, um, yeah. regardless of, sort of the amount of money that Elon Musk and others will be, are throwing at that problem. Yeah. And the other way, of course, is to crack a way of doing non-invasive recording of individual neurons. And there are some... There are some um, tantalizing hints of ways to do that. Um, sort of either back of envelope sketches of what it would look like or a couple of technology demonstrations using, for example, uh, demonstrations of using ultrasound to record to record groups of neurons at once in animal brains. Um, and there are other more advanced things like trying to record the, uh, the lifetime activity of a neuron onto a engineered strand of RNA. So it will flip a base every time it spikes and you read out the flipped okay. bases um, as a timestamp and you'd be able to, this is this molecular ticker tape idea that's been around for a while. But all these are kind of sci-fi stuff. So yeah, prosaically how we go about closing the gap is going to be a while. I suppose I, some people, um, historically very intelligent people, um, like, Leibniz, for example, have thought there's something like a like a soul that you know is the animating force of a human. If um, this is going to be a weird question, but if if that was the case, if that was true, how could you actually find out? Like, would there be a point where you say, okay, we've reached a stopping point? Because natural explanations, you don't really say, oh, you know, we've got the final scientific theory here. We're going to stop kind of looking. How how do you think the evidence would look if? Um, if it wasn't the case that there was like a fully natural or material explanation for human consciousness? 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it would look. That's a weird would, one, but it would. It would look. It's a good question because it would. Um, as you say, most also natural sciences don't have to deal with this issue of where you'd run out of explanation. Yeah. I mean, even even when you get to things like um, uh, photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is a good example because it turns out photosynthesis uses quantum properties. It uses, it uses electron tunneling in the process of um, of uh, of uh, part of uh, um, transmuting the yeah, the photon arriving into ATP. Um, so there is. There are certain processes in, in, in biology where you, that you just tunnel deeper and deeper and deeper down, and you keep going down, yeah. down, down, um, and you get more and more detail, and eventually you go, well, that's the entire circuit diagram. We know now yeah. photosynthesis from photon arrives to the thing that happens at the other end. That's the whole cascade. That's just it, right? Um, and we had to go down to to the quantum level to find it, um, and of course, um, we're still very, very far away from even in close that level explanation for even the most elementary things in the brain yeah and it would be it yeah it would be a question of when yeah, the point at which you have to stop digging i suppose the fact that a number of people obviously have already leapt to the quantum ver level of the brain to try and find explanations for things <laughs> um it's more of a consequence of the fact that we know so little about the, what's happening in the brain than there being any actual scientific reason to jump there yeah um but yeah, I have often been wondering what the final neuroscience paper would look like. Yeah. Um, and I can't picture it in my head. It's not going to be, we solve the brain. It's going to be, that's as far as we can get. And that's it. That's your lot. <laughs> we can't do any more. Um, yes. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I can appreciate that's a really, a really difficult one to answer. Because I, I mean, I suppose when... I, I talk to a fair amount of people who do think there's something like a Cartesian soul or something. And it, I mean, I'm generally quite critical of that view because I don't understand it whatsoever, but I do wonder what it would look like if we sort of hit a point where we had a, you know, like we've, like you say that we've completed the sort of circuit diagram according to physics of what's going on reductively. And it's like, but we've not, we've not accounted for what's going on. What, what, what could we even do next? I suppose. Um, it's a weird one. Thing. It would require some kind of evidence that there was a that there was a causal thing missing from all of the no matter how detailed we got missing from the, the causal chain of stuff that you could lay out right. that somehow say for example the production of um, the volitional production of language was uh, wasn't just spikes being passed into the bits of auditory cortex and uh, so bits of the temporal lobe rather that are have been co-opted to make words appear and then co-opt the muscles of your jaw and the tongue and the larynx and so on. Um, but the actual process of those words appearing in the first place, the idea to speak, uh, there was no obvious cause or antecedent for that happening. So um, the last question then is, what is neurobolix and what are the worst offenders, I suppose, in sort of pop culture of, um, you know, the I, I suppose people co-opting the language or the the findings from neuroscience and sort of getting them wrong you know, in day-to-day -day kind of speak about things. Yeah. So neurobolox, I think, was coined by a journalist at the New Statesman um, about the trend for uh, great swathes of culture to stick the word neuro on the front of almost anything to make it sound scientific and scientific and really attached to the brain in some way. And this, this obviously is deeply irritating at two levels. So one is that what they stick neuro on, they actually mean psychology and not neuroscience. It's mostly about stuff about um, how we interact with people or how we're influenced by where you place something in an advert. The kind of things that you study in a human population by asking people lots of questions or having them sit and look at a screen. So psychology rather than the level of, level of neuroscience. Um, and then it's particularly irritating then not just that they mean neuroscience, but obviously what they do as third as neuroscience is typically wrong or um, twisted in such a way as to be to be almost in, uh, sort of un, unrecognizable as something that would appear as a as a piece of neuroscience. So the um, I give I mean I give three examples in the book. There are many I talk about briefly about sort of uh, neuro law. This idea of which is I mean, there is obviously. Um, a case to be made that you can use findings from psychology to inform how you go about, you know, how you go about sentencing people, how you go about assessing people, how you go about treating evidence, particularly eyewitness testimony. 
there's a huge amount right. of psychology research and I witness tennis for me, that's fine. But what neural laws tend to refer to is sticking someone on an fMRI machine, looking how their brain lights up when you ask them a series of questions as though it's some kind of lie detector thing. Um, when of course <laughs> it's just a, it's this blood flow to a certain part of the brain and not another. So you can probably tell with someone's looking at a picture of a frog rather than a sheep. Um, that's fine. But as a way of sort of being able to tell um, any sort of insight into their sort of the construct of their personality or the or whether they are genuinely a sociopath or not, um, just by looking at the the sort of blood flow in different parts of the brain is back to phrenology type stuff. Yeah. Um, Probably the worst offender, though, is, um, I guess, uh, neurocriticism was, okay. was, was I come up quite a bit, um, which appears to be something about how you um, how you would sort of treat research in psychology and neuroscience as a way of understanding people's uh, views of particular cultural works. I think okay. that's as much as I prefer to delve into that area. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That <laughs> sounds like it could get kind of kind of wild pretty quick. Um, so if anyone has got some questions in the chat, I'm just scroll because I haven't been looking at the chat throughout. Um, let me see if I can find. We had a journey, a spike through the brain. Um, can can we can we use the brain? I, the I think the the it, one of the words is backwards here. Can we using the brain? Uh, to understand how to build a quantum computer. So, well, short answer, um, no. <laughs> so, um, as says, we know we know so little about what happens at the quantum level in the brain, or whether it's relevant to its computation or not. Um, that I, if we are going to have a quantum computer, it will be done way before we understand that brain at anything like that level. I would say. Um, and then how should we understand emotional intelligence? Um, good question. I guess that really that's a construct obviously for, for the psychologists to talk about rather than the, the hardcore neuroscientists. Um, there is, I mean, there is, partly because emotional intelligence, of course, is all about social interaction. And there really is very little work on how, what happens at the neuron, individual neuron level for social interaction. Partly just a technical reason that it's really difficult enough to record the neurons in one animal at the same at once, rather than recording them in multiple animals at the same time to work out. I mean, there is there's some work on this, for example, on um, on um, in, there's a work in I think in ferrets, and there's some work in uh, ground voles, which are uh, some kind of a famously sort of um, a species that lives in groups a lot. Okay. Uh, where they looking at how neural activity in 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 whether they recognize each other or not, and how they behave around each other. So. At the, at the sort of level of neurons sending individual spikes, um, we're only in the beginning, really, of a kind of a that kind of sort of social neuroscience. I, I'm trying not to sort of uh, laugh at some of the comments people have put about uh, dark neuroquantum and this <laughs> quantum conversation is neuro legit. Um, <laughs> is intelligence merely the number of neurons in the central nervous system uh, or uh, anywhere else? Yeah, uh, no. So. Yeah, no is the answer. That's nice, simple. No. So then, obviously, we know that, for example, um, the elephant has more neurons in its brain than we do by quite some margin. But almost all of those neurons are in its cerebellum because it's because the cerebellum is is control used. You know, it's for fine motor control, and its trunk is one of the the elephant's trunk is one of the most finely controlled uh, motor systems on the planet. It requires a huge number of muscles to control it, and that uh, it's unbelievably degree of freedom movement and it's it's fine suck tip um we we know that um obviously we also we have great examples of course of of different bird species so obviously um corvids are famously highly intelligent seem to use tool use recognize people um can learn culturally from each other lots of scary things uh, crows and ravens can do um and their brains are absolutely minute compared to, to mammals so obviously they're on the scale of um a few, uh, at most, say, I think a Corbett brain would be about 10 million. Um, a cat's brain is on for, what, 100 million, something like that, okay. um, or higher. And uh, so it's not simply not the number of neurons. It's, where, it's more about where the neurons are in the brain. So so Corvids have folded, uh, I'll hesitate to say cortex, but it's their cortex, folded cortices like we do, like primates do. 
which is why they are so intelligent for their size because they've, they've packed so many more neurons into their brains for the brain size than is packed into say a rat's brain for its size um, and that appears to be a a predictor of intelligence not just sort of where but how much has been packed in compared to your body size and we are the apex of that because we have brains which are vastly larger than we should be able to sustain given our our body size right um does magnetism play a role in any function of the brain so we yeah uh, we think there are some animals obviously which use magnetism to navigate right so obviously there's some bird species we know use that navigation magnetism to navigate and we also think some rodents can detect weakly magnetic fields um all oh, electric fish of course can uh, by the sense they use the right. electrical fields to, to navigate completely so in that sense in the maxwell sense of electromagnetism yes um so we know these some of these animals have have neurons that respond to, must have neurons that respond to magnetic fields because they 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 use them um there, but there is the work has been done to look at actually how those neurons encode that magnetism. As I understand, it, it's been quite controversial. So I don't think we know a lot about exactly how it's encoded, but we do know that there are species that use magnetism, so their brains must be able to do something with it. And then the last question uh, from the chat, and then we'll wrap this up, is uh, seeing that breakthroughs at the single neuron level are far away, what significant breakthroughs are expected in the near future? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Fortune turning. So, um, the, obviously the, the easiest version of course is the technology version, right? So we can extrapolate out from the current technology trends and, and see just the sheer scale of data we'll be getting soon. So for example, there was a demonstration in February this year of recording from a million neurons at the same time, million individual neurons at the same time in a mouse brain, um, which is on a scale, which is what, um, two orders of magnitude bigger than was achieved before so that means we can there's only in the mouse cortex there's only 10 million neurons so that means that we can look at about one tenth of this entire cortex of the level of individual neurons at the same time um not unfortunately at quite the speed we want to because this uses a, a video imaging system that only takes uh, a frame every half a second so you're looking at it every every sort of two hertz recording rate which means that we have a neuron ascending spikes at a rate of 10 or 30 spikes a second. You don't see most of them. You just see this big burst of activity and go, that was on. That's what we can see. Um, but the sheer scale of what we can see in the brain is is dramatically increasing. And what the most, what the biggest breakthrough is going to be early on for, from that is it's going to be about tearing up all the textbooks about which bit of the brain does what. Okay. So, um, so the most classic example is your, is your medics, right? So your medics are, they, they have their neuroscience courses, they're trained to, play. so this bit of the brain, motor cortex, stick a flag in it, that does, it moves the arms right. and it's responsible for fine motor control and it encodes this, stick in a flag in visual cortex, that does primary visual areas, sees so seeing, uh, stick a flag in other bits of the brain, you get given a particular function that it does. Um, and um, this, uh, it's almost certainly going to go away because as soon as we start recording for many, many neurons at once, you're going to start seeing that all these different things you think are synced per particular part of the brain encodes is actually encoded um, all over the brain. So yes, we know that the early visual part of the brain, it's the one that receives the input directly from the retina. But we also know by now that lots of neurons in the visual cortex respond to movement which seems to be a really bizarre thing to do if what your job is there for is only to look to encode sort of the early, the sort of primary elements of the visual world. And that kind of sort of breaking apart of our understanding of this sort of these little modules, it's going to be the big breakthrough. We're going to move from this really modular view of the brain to this really holistic view of how the whole brain is, is uh, the spikes being passed from neurons all over it. It's doing this on mass computation rather than these localized computations that are then put together somehow. Right. Interesting. Well, thank you for your time and coming on. Is there anywhere you'd want to direct people in particular in terms of um, stuff that you're putting out there, a best place to buy the book, uh, anything that you're working on that you want people to look out for? Um, let me see. So um, to terms of the book, obviously, um, it's available quite widely. If you're anywhere in the world that is not in the primary English markets, then you can go and buy it direct from the Princeton University website and they'll ship it anywhere in the world, which is handy. Um, yeah, I mean, the main thing is um, 
I see, I, I write a, a, a publication on Medium called called The Spike, um, which is uh, which is a, a sort of um, a way of getting a lot of this this systems neuroscience stuff out into the sort of broader domain. So I cover all kinds of things. We touched on things from about the insights and depression, about uh, flaws in fMRI research. We talked about uh, yeah, decision making. We've talked about um, uh, those recent breakthrough of recording a million neurons with all uh, in a variety of you know essays and skits and stuff. So that's a, the sort of main outlet for where keeping up with ongoing research in neuroscience is where I'm trying to keep a keep a constant flow of stuff coming out there. Well, I'll put, I'll put the links yeah. to those in the description for people as well. Were you going to say something else? Sorry, oh, it, no. that second leg or so. I yeah, I thought it, it seemed like you were about to start like another phrase, and then I started talking. And I think it's that like one second or so that's between us, but. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's been really interesting. What I'll do then is I'll play the the ending credits, but then uh, and kill the stream, and then we'll still be here in the background though after. So it'll be one second while that plays. Thank you everyone for watching. If you've enjoyed it, then be sure to share it around with someone who you might who you think might enjoy it, um, and also leave a comment letting me know what you thought. Bye.